Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't have to sit here. I could stand. Watch. I've loved this evening. I've loved listening to all the stories. Uh, and uh, and here's, uh, here's another one. I was born in uh, New Haven, Connecticut a number of years ago. <laughs> and uh, I could be the oldest person on the stage tonight, I think. <laughs> I, I didn't see everybody, but I think. Uh, when I was a little kid, I wondered if, uh, if I could get my fingers in my father's head and twist uh, a little screw a sixteenth of an inch in one direction or another, he might tell right from wrong. Because he never did. I was nine years old uh, and there was a, uh, I was, it, it was summer, I was going to summer camp for the first time and I couldn't have been more excited. There was a little roll of, of uh, uh, tape cloth that said Norman M. Lear, Norman M. Lear, Norman M. Lear that my mother was going to sew into the, uh, the clothes I would be taking to camp. And it just couldn't have been a more exciting moment. Also, my father was uh, going off to Oklahoma. He was flying to Oklahoma with some men that my mother said, I don't like those men, Herman. I don't want you uh, messing with those men. And, uh, but Herman knew everything. He used to tell me, I've been everywhere where the grass grows green, Norman, and I know everything. Man actually said that. <laughs> and uh, he was off. He was arrested when he came back. It turned out he had been trying to sell, or they had, uh, these men my mother didn't care for, had caused them to, uh, to try to sell some fake bonds uh, from a Boston brokerage company. And he was arrested when he got off the plane. That night, uh, or the next night, uh, the morning paper uh, had a picture of my father holding a hat in front of his face, manacled to a detective coming out of the courthouse. And the paper was lying around that night all over the place. Uh, and my mother had a house full of people because uh, she had decided she couldn't live in Chelsea. This was Chelsea, Massachusetts. She couldn't live there in that kind of shame. So she was leaving. As it turned out, I didn't know that she was going to take my sister. I had one three years younger sister. She was going to take my sister and kind of disappear. And I was going to go to an uncle and another uncle and another uncle and wind up with, eventually with my grandparents in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, it was a, 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 an awful scene. The place was, the house was crowded. My mother was selling the furniture. And especially when she started to sell uh, my father's red leather chair. My father had a red leather chair that he used to control the Atwater Kent radio. It was why we needed a floor model radio, I'll never know. <laughs> but we had a floor model radio. And he used to sit in his red leather chair and control that dial when we listened to Jack Benny and Fred Allen and all the radio shows at the time. This, of course, was before television. And, uh, and my father was going to, was arrested, as I said, when he came back from Oklahoma. He was supposed to bring me back a 10-gallon hat, uh, like my favorite movie actor Ken Maynard wore. And that may be why I've been attracted all my life to wearing a hat, because I've been wearing this hat for 50-some years at least. And it could be because my dad was coming home with a hat. Uh, as my mother was selling this red leather chair, the guy who seemed to be purchasing it 
put his hand on my shoulder and said, well, you're the man of the house now. And I think that was the moment that I learned the foolishness of the human condition. This asshole <laughs> is looking at a nine-year-old kid puts in, uh, under these circumstances, puts his hand on his shoulder and says, well, you're the man of the house now. I know that that was the moment I began to absorb the foolishness of the human condition. It never left me. I saw it when I went to this uncle and that uncle and uh, they had no understanding at all of uh, what I was going through. And I mean, what I was going through was a piece of what I've used all my life uh, in my work, that aloneness. I believe we are all alone in this world. Whatever our situations are, whatever our families are, we are still, each of us, alone in the world. And that served me well in the, in the writing of everything I did from that point on. Uh, along the way, before All in the Family, I made a film in uh, Greenfield, Iowa, called Cold Turkey. It was about a city that was uh, committed where the, the minister uh, got the city to agree uh, all of the smokers to stop smoking for 30 days. So they all took a pledge to stop smoking for 30 days. And the film was about what the media around the country made of a town that said they were gonna give up smoking. It was, I couldn't be more proud of anything I've ever done than that film, uh, which had a lot to say about media and America. And uh, in the course of the film, I had a little girl uh, in a montage where she was perhaps on the screen for three seconds. She was crossing the street and a, and a mother ma um, a traffic monitor was screaming at her. And it was an illustration of bad behavior of the city of all the smokers who had given up smoking the morning following their pledge. And uh, the little girl's name was Amy. And she was on the screen for two and a half, three seconds. 25 years later, the town of Greenfield, Iowa, invited me to come back with as many of the players as I could bring. They wanted to celebrate the 25th anniversary of cold turkey in Greenfield, Iowa. Dick Van Dyke starred in the film, he came back with me. Pippa Scott came back with me. Uh, Tom Poston, for those who remember Tom Poston, Bob Newhart was in the film, and Edith Bunker Jean Stapleton was in the film, this was, as I said before, all in the family. They all came back and we had the most incredible weekend in, uh, in Greenfield, Iowa. I knew that those people would be telling time by the year that the, uh, the summer of the film was made there. Oh, Gert, now she got married in, no, no, that was two years before Greenfield. No, no, that was before Cold Turkey. When Cold Turkey, she had already, and indeed that's the way it was in, in that community, and we had a whale of a, of a time. Uh, and in the course of that, the little girl that was on the screen, her name was Amy, for about three seconds, got a hold of me and threw her arms around me and told me that, that my decision to use her in that little role was just the most important thing in her life. And she spent a couple of minutes talking to me about how important that was to her. And, uh, and I appreciated it as much as I could and hugged her and we kissed and, uh, and now take a long dissolve. I've, d I've done All in the Family and, the, and, and the, all the shows, the, the, uh, the Jeffersons and Good Times, all the shows that followed from there. And it's a great many years later and uh, I've written a book. This was last, just last year. Even this I get to experience, which is true of this moment for me. Even this with all of you, I get to experience. It took me 93 years to get here to this moment. <laughs> so, uh, 
I, I swear to God I didn't do that for applause. Uh, but in the course of, uh, of uh, running around the country talking about the book, uh, I get a call. I'm in, in somewhere in, in uh, Massachusetts, I think. I get a call. Uh, Greenfield, Iowa would like me to come back. They want to celebrate. Uh, and what they're holding from me is the information that they're going to name a theater after me. I, I agree to go back there because I'm selling the book. I'm thrilled to be going back to Iowa. <laughs> Nobody else was available to go back with me. It, most, it, a lot of them were, had passed on. Uh, and I went back alone. And it was a great evening. And, and uh, the governor introduced me. And there must have been 300 people at dinner in this big ballroom. And, so, and they had named the theater the Marquis. Uh, next door to the ballroom uh, was the Norman Lear Theater. And uh, the moment of moments was Amy, who was now 51. Uh, threw her arms around me and said, you know, Mr. Lear, I was 31, 20 years ago when you came back to Greenfield. And I told you what that meant to me. And, uh, and you were very nice about it. You, we hugged and you kissed me. And she said, but you didn't get it. And you're going to get it now. <laughs> I couldn't imagine where the hell she was going with this. <laughs> She said, I read your book. She said, when you were in your 10th summer, you were in Woodstock, Connecticut. Your father was in prison. Your mother and your sister had disappeared. And you were in the only cottage the whole family, all the relatives could afford. And it was crowded with families and kids. And, but you were all together alone, and nobody understood the pain you were in. And you couldn't describe the pain in your book. It was so uh, strong. She said, but you had a gray and a blue sweatshirt. And you used to put that on in the late afternoon. And in that sweatshirt, you felt stronger and taller and tougher and wiser, smarter. And, uh, and you used to walk down Savin Rock to a place called Sloppy Joe's. And you, among strangers at Sloppy Joe's in your gray and blue sweatshirt, you were, you know, more comfortable, more at home, more yourself. You felt better than you did with your family back in, in the cottage. She said, well, you were my blue and gray sweatshirt. And I wept. And she wept. And I understood that in this life, you know, when I was making that film, I made 2,000 decisions the day I said, that little girl will use her. I was in, uh, on location with 100 people in a, in a crew and, and actors. And so, I, mean, I made, uh, you know, so many decisions. And that little decision, that kid, meant so much to her life. And I've thought from that moment on, how much all of us, how many little things all of us do that we don't know we've done that make for somebody else's pleasure, for somebody else's growth, for somebody else's feeling of success, of, uh, of being born for a particular moment. and. Uh, it was one of the great lessons of my life. And when I walked away from Amy now, as I said, 51, I walked away feeling like I was still wearing my blue and gray sweatshirt. Thank you. Thank you. Norman Lear, ladies and gentlemen.